Are you a sheep or are you a goat? That's the most important question you could ever ask yourself. Hi, I'm David Servant. This is Heavenward TV. It is great to be together once again as we continue our chronological study through the entire New Testament. And we're going to do our best to finish uh, the Olivet Discourse, where we've been quite a while, but it's been enriching, it's been enlightening. It's always good to read the truth coming straight from the lips of Jesus. And I hope that uh, we've been doing a uh, a good job in not trying to twist Jesus' words or make him say something that he didn't really say, but taking what he said at face value and making sure it harmonizes with the, all the rest of Scripture. And if you've been with us, I think you uh, would affirm that that is indeed what we've been attempting to do. Okay. Now, in this last chapter, chapter 25 of Matthew, we've been harmonizing these Scriptures that are so... Uh, emphasizing the necessity of holiness, obedience to the commandments of God and so forth in order to ultimately inherit eternal life and tried to show that this is in no way in opposition to what the Bible teaches about salvation by grace. Uh, however, it does help us to rethink grace and to examine the kind of grace that's being proffered uh, in many quarters, which is turns out to be a false grace, a grace that the Bible itself specifically, explicitly warns against. Amber, I quoted you one time before from the little tiny uh, epistle of Jude, where Jude warns against those teachers of his day whom he said were turning the grace of our God into licentiousness. That is, they were proclaiming a perverse version of God's grace, saying it doesn't make any difference how you live. You don't have to be holy. The commandments are irrelevant in regard to your eternal destiny because we're saved by grace through faith. Well, <laughs> that is heretical. And uh, it ought to be condemned wherever it's heard. Yes, we're saved by grace, but it's not a grace that gives us a license to sin, as I've said over and over again, okay? It's a grace that gives us an opportunity to turn from our sin, be forgiven, and walk the narrow road, all right? And that is grace. I can only say I have been saved by grace. We've been asking the question, so what is the standard of holiness? What's the minimum standard of holiness? What's the minimum transformation we should expect to see in someone who truly has believed in Jesus Christ? And we've looked at a few scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Paul lists 10 very grievous lifestyles that will exclude a person from the kingdom of God. And we looked at what Jesus said to the rich young ruler, citing uh, five uh, or six very major major commandments saying if you wish to enter a life you got to keep these commandments okay so we're 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 honing it down now as we work into our way into the final part of the sermon uh, of the uh, the Olivet discourse in which Jesus affirms the necessity of one other commandment the one that he listed to the rich young ruler and that is loving your neighbor as yourself and he's going to help us understand what that means, as he has in other places, starting in Matthew chapter 25 and verse number 31. And this is no parable. This is a foretelling of a, of a future judgment. Although there is some symbolism in it, it is not a parable. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory, isn't that what this has all been about? This whole all of that discourse started by them asking him the question, what will be the sign of your coming? And he's told them many things about that. So now he reverts back to the original subject. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. And the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one another. Now here's the metaphorical expression. As the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And so shepherds in Christ's day, you know, were shepherding not just sheep, not just goats, but sheep as well as goats. They all mixed together, and at times they would separate them one from another because they're not the same, and their natures are not the same, okay? And if you know anything about sheep and goats, you know goats, self-willed, apt to wander, 
uh, stubborn, not easy to get along with. Sheep, however, are you know followers to the max, okay, and easy to get along with. Well, so there's going to be a separation of all the nations, and and uh, you know obviously he's talking here about the people of all the nations, and uh, he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. So again, this is symbolic. They're not, not goats and sheep literally. It's people who fall into one or the other category. God's going to divide all of the people of all the nations into two groups. What determines which group they find themselves in? More importantly, you know, as you, if you've read this, you know that which group you're in determines your eternal destiny, whether you inherit eternal life or whether you're cast into, uh, you know, the fire of hell. So this is very serious stuff. And this, this reaffirms everything I've been saying because this is a judgment that determines eternal destiny and it's not based upon anyone's profession of faith or whether they believe in Jesus or whether they uh, you know, went to church or whether they believe we're saved by grace through faith. Uh, or, you know, none of that stuff at all. N no questions, no litmus test of, of theology, no litmus test of eschatology, no litmus test of if you have the Trinity down right. No, it comes down to one thing. Did you love me and did you prove your love for me by loving members of my spiritual family who were desperate? Desperate. Did you care? That shows what was really in your heart. And so all of these things, once again, are, these are bare bones minimum standards. If you, if you think to yourself as you read this, well, hmm, if I stood that judgment, I, I, I'd be more like the goats. You're a goat. You're, you're going to hell. I know, very, very sobering stuff, but that's the message here. That's the message here. I'll be right back. Okay, welcome back. We are in Matthew 25, looking at this very sobering passage spoken right from the lips of Jesus, the foretelling of the future judgment of the sheep and the goats. Don't listen to any preacher who says, this does not have application to you. Uh, this only has application to people uh, during the tribulation period and, uh, or something like that. Or I I've even heard such perverse interpretations as someone saying, well, uh, this because it says all the nations will be gathered before him. That means that, uh, you know, it's symbolic of uh, the, the, the actual nations. Well, you got, you know, South Korea, you got Russia, you, you got Taiwan, you, you got Costa Rica, you got Canada and so forth. And, and depending on how those nations treated Israel during the tribulation, because those are the, she said, the least of these, my brethren. So he's talking about, of course, his Jewish brethren, because Jesus was Jewish. How those nations treated uh, the, the Jews during the tribulation uh, determines, you know, how he deals with them. Well, that's such a perverse, obviously perverse, ridiculous interpretation. In the end, uh, you know, the end result is some people get eternal life, some people are cast into hell. So you need me to tell me that based upon what geographical, uh, geopolitical nation you might live in during the tribulation, let's say you're a wonderful Christian who loves God, but you happen to live, into, live in a nation that is against Israel and persecutes Israel with the help of the Antichrist, you go to hell forever, lover of God, believer in Jesus, because you live in the wrong place? Are you kidding me? Or vice versa? You know, uh, you, you, you are a wicked, evil, perverse sinner who happened to live in a nation that was friendly toward Israel during their tribulation, so you get to inherit eternal life? Are you kidding me? No. You will be one day at this judgment. Get it into your head. And if you right now, if your life resembles the goats more than the sheep, you're a goat. 
You're, you're not on the narrow road that leads to life. You're not fulfilling the commandment to love your neighbor as yourself, which is the second greatest commandment. You have to do something, for goodness sakes, to love the body of Christ. And John reiterated this same message you know, in his epistle. This is all through the Bible, really, but there's some that just bang out, you know, and they're just inescapable. Can I read to you from 1 John 3.14? Listen closely now. We're talking about the minimum transformation that has to occur in the life of the true believer, or it reveals he's not a true believer. We're talking about the minimum degree of obedience and holiness that we must attain to, or we risk being excluded from that which we could otherwise enjoy. That's the whole message of the sheep and the goats, and Jesus is still speaking his words to Peter, James, John, and Andrew. 1 John 3, 14. We know that we have passed out of death into life. We've been born again. We've gone from spiritual death to spiritual life. How do we know that? Because we love the brethren. That's the most telling sign of all. That's the first fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love. If you get the Holy Spirit in you, there's going to have to be some love, okay? Compassion, mercy towards the least of these. Everyone who hates his brother, John says, is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. See, John had a standard. He believed there was a minimum transformation. People who are murderers, whether they murder people who are, who, who are their, you know, enemies or their their, you know, their relatives or the babies in their own wombs. Murderers do not inherit eternal life. Now, you can repent of murder and be forgiven and get eternal life, but you can't die a murderer. We know love by this. Now, now John is about to define that love which defines all true Christians. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Now he goes on to define that. Clarify that. Whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? That's a rhetorical question. The answer is obviously the love of God does not abide in him. Little children, let us not love with word or tongue, but in deed and truth. Okay? And we will know by this that we are of the truth. When we see our actions, when we see our obedience, we will know that we, by this we are of the truth, and we will assure our heart before him. And whatever our heart condemns us, for God is greater than our heart and knows all things. And so if you've got one of those hearts that's condemning you, saying you're not really, you know, you don't really have it, you don't really have the Holy Spirit in you, take a look at your life. And here's how you get assurance. You get assurance from the obedience, looking at the signs of your love for the brethren. Okay, so we go back to Matthew 25 now, and uh, the sheep are on his right, the goats on his left, and verse number 44, 34, then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. These guys are getting eternal life. For I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. So Jesus lists six things there that the, these sheep, these true believers in him, those who really loved him, proved their love for him by loving these people, the least of these. These people were desperate. They were, they were his own brothers and sisters, members of our spiritual family. They were hungry. They were thirsty. They, they were strangers, refugees. They, they were naked. It doesn't mean necessarily literally naked, no clothes, but naked to the elements and needed a coat to keep them warm. Um, they were sick you know, confined to their homes or something or a hospital bed. I was in prison. You know, they're incarcerated. And, and, and whether they were incarcerated for their faith, it doesn't make any difference. You know, if they're a follower of Christ and they find themselves in prison, we ought to be caring about those people. Okay? And you came and you visited me. And they were really surprised about that. You know, when did we see you a stranger invite you in and so forth? They were really surprised about that. Uh, Boy, th th this is powerful. And if you say, well, I don't, I, I, I'm not involved in any of that, then you're a goat. You know, I said, you say, that rattles me. Good, 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 good. I'll be right back.
Okay, welcome back. We are finishing out the Olivet Discourse, Matthew chapter 25, the judgment of the sheep and the goats. And we've just gone through uh, Jesus' words to the sheep, and they're surprised about all this. Uh, obviously, the things that he said you did, they weren't trying to do those things in order to, you know, gain his favor. They were doing those things from their own nature, their own regenerated nature. The Holy Spirit in them made them new creations in Christ. Okay, they were saved by grace through faith, let me tell you, but there was proof of their faith because faith without works is dead. And the preeminent work, of course, of the Spirit is producing love in us. All right, so let's continue reading from we left off last time in verse number 37. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? When do we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of the one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. And so when we see a fellow brother or sister in Christ who is suffering in these ways that Christ listed, they're in this state of uh, deprivation and uh, need, well, that's an opportunity. You know, would you do that for Jesus if you saw him in, in, in this degree of deprivation? Well, of course, say, Jesus, I want to, I'll do anything for you. Well, Jesus is in them. He's incarnated in the least of these. Jesus Christ lives in all of those who believe in him by the Holy Spirit. And so how can we say we believe in Jesus when we see members of his family in this type of deprivation and do nothing and close our heart against them, as John said? How does the love of God abide in us? It doesn't. We're goats, not really sheep. Well, it goes on to it goes on now, and here's the other side. Now, the the king turns to the goats. Then he will say to those on his left, "Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels." You're going to go right to the place where the devil and all of his angels are ultimately going to find themselves. Wow. For I was hungry. You gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty. You gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger. You did not invite me in. Naked, you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, you did not visit me. Then they themselves will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? I guess they weren't listening very closely to what he just said to the sheep. Maybe they couldn't hear. Then he'll answer them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it, to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. So there, what he's saying is you had ample opportunity, abundant opportunity throughout your lifetime. And I, and I suppose that many of these were professing believers. You know, they call him Lord, 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 when did we see you? The implication is, had we seen you, Lord, like this, well, we would have done something because we love you, Lord. But he's saying, no, you don't love me. You're, you're one of those professors, but you're not a doer of my word. You don't keep my commandments. You might know them, but you don't do what I say to do. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, he asked one time, and not do what I say? He warned, many in that day will say, Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name and work miracles and prophesy? And he said, depart from me, I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. Tell me that holiness and obedience has nothing to do with salvation. And I will tell you, you're dead wrong dead wrong. So it's clear as a bell. Clear as a bell. And I, I, for the life of me, I don't understand why this passage of Scripture isn't talked about more often. I don't understand why it isn't talked about all the time within the body of Christ. In fact, in some evangelical circles, works is a dirty word. And if you even mention holiness, you're accused of being a, a, a legalist. Well, if I'm a legalist, so is Jesus. He said this, not me. Then he will answer them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it. So it's all based on what you did and didn't do. It's based on your works. We'll be judged according to our works because it's our works that reveal true saving faith. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. One or the other, Jesus gives us no hope that there's any kind of purgatory uh, where over time, you know, people come to their senses 
and uh, say, wow, I repent. And then God says mercifully, okay, since you repented, I finally persuaded you. Now I'm going to let you out and give you eternal life. No, both of these fates are eternal. It's either, it's either eternal life or it's eternal punishment. One of those two. Nothing in between. And as much as we may want there to be something in between, there's nothing in between those two. And where does that eternal punishment take place? It takes place in the eternal fire because that's exactly what he said in verse number 41. Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire. It's been prepared, he said, for the devil and his angels. Okay, so I don't know about you, but I, I, when I read this, I, 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 I lose my smile. I can't, you can't do this half heartily or jovially or, you know, crack a joke. It's just impossible. This is absolutely too sobering. And I'm afraid that the majority of professing Christians in the Western world and, 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 and the rest of the world, because I've traveled in 50 nations and preached all over those places, I think I have a you know, pretty good understanding of the pulse of what's going on in many places. I'm afraid that so many people who profess to be Christians they're really goats. And, 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 and this scripture confirms that and, and, and leaves no doubt about it. So just as, just as Paul warned fornicators, adulterers, thieves, you know, just as John warned liars, murderers, none of these people have eternal life, those who do not love their neighbor as themselves and express it by caring for those in these kinds of desperate situations, they don't have eternal life either. Okay, well, close on this note. There is one case where we don't have to be concerned about the poor, and I'll talk about that next time. Don't miss it. See you then.